ora. I'm Tom Kitchen and today on the detail I'm very carefully clambering around some rocks on the coastline between Milford and Takapuna in the north shore of Auckland. Right, which way do I go now? Look, there used to be quite a popular walkway along this area, but this part that I'm walking on around these uh, rock pools has been closed off due to a bit of a stoush. Just got to clamber up these rocks here. There's a bit of a stoush here between the council and the landowners that we are going to talk about today. The Takapuna to Milf Beach Walkway a summer treat for many in Auckland. Stop for a swim at Minnehaha Beach along the way, but now you'll see a big fence. Closed, cancelled, kaput. This is the wall that's dividing not just a walkway, but an entire community. A dispute over an Auckland property's heritage status has split one of the city's great walks in two. Walked by tens of thousands, the North Shore Coastal Route runs through more than 70 private properties. A section of the Milford Takapuna walkway is closed because of a fight. The fight is between the owners of the property that it crosses, it crosses the front of that property, the owners of that property, and also the council. Because the owners want the council to remove heritage status from a cottage that got on their land. While I'm scrambling over the rocks, I meet Auckland Councillor for Albany, John Watson, who helps explain the situation. What brings you along here today to this uh, beautiful area of the shore between Milford and Takapuna? <laughs> well, uh, we had a petition presented to us uh, last week, I think it was, from the local residents association on the, the, the fencing of this walk. And, of course, it's such an iconic walk that I've you know, spent a large part of my life coming down to occasionally, so I just thought I'd come on and, and see what's happening on the ground. Uh, right, so you just clambered through uh, <laughs> the rocks. Y- y- yes, well, I, I know you have to clamber around a few places uh, along this walk anyway, so I, I just wanted to see what it was like, and, you know, parts of it are a little precarious, and it's not altogether clear whether people will be able to continue to access the driveway up here, which seems to be on the private property as well. I guess if you know if you're fairly athletic, you, you'd be able to to climb along here. But I guess my concern is that you know a lot of the people that walk along here, you know, they're like myself. We're we're, we're not exactly in the spring of eternal youth, and you don't really want people trying to clamber over there because someone will will inevitably fall, and that that won't be that won't be good. Why is this property so important? It's so important because it's, uh, it's obviously a key link along the route. I think there's 70 odd properties here along this walkway that are private property that the, the walkway goes over. This one has been under discussion for over a decade in terms of trying to resolve the access and if you know, long story short, that the current owners obviously have got frustrated and um, have put the fence up as perhaps as a bargaining chip for trying to get what they want out of it, which which I think at the moment goes to largely removing the heritage status of the batch there, and that's not a straight process in itself. Why does it have the heritage status? What's so important about that property that it has a heritage well, status? Well, it has, and it has the strongest, it has a Category A heritage um, status, and I think it goes to the nature of the, the kind of beachside batch or, or that... Uh, was indicative of that that time period, um, early last century. And what is the council's role now? What what's it trying to do? Well, the council, the council, in my in my view, and I, I'm not um, kind of a spokesman for the the organisation as such, but but my view is they they obviously have to try and come up with some solution to enable the walk to to continue it to to this thus far. As I said, over a decade, there there has nothing has emerged. It's such a popular and such an impressive walk that it's not going to be obviously acceptable to the community just to leave it at, a, at this sort of impasse. Some, something's going to have to come out of every, all the discussions. It's definitely not acceptable to these people walking along the track. It's a long time walkway that's always been here and I guess we've just come along and seen that this is here. Very disappointed. We just live in Green High and would come here quite often. 
walking along. It's a lovely walk, good place for the kids. Mm, mm. And now it's like, oh, damn, can't enjoy the beach and the rocks. Were you quite surprised to find it like that? Yeah, just today. Yeah, we were. Yeah, yeah. very. <laughs> it was like, oh. So no, I didn't even know about it, actually. Obviously, if we had known, we would have stopped like down there and not worried about coming up here. But we expected to be able to walk from Milford to take a pony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a clamber. <laughs> yeah, so no good for um, old people or Zimmer frames, that's for sure. Uh, but quite fun, if it's not high tide. Do you usually go around this walkway at all? Yeah, yeah, it's the nicest little walkway in Auckland, probably. It's mm. in the, uh, the North Head. Yeah, it's beautiful. How do you feel about it being closed? Oh, it's not great. <laughs> Seems like the council should sort of work with the landowners, right, and organise that. Yeah. Especially with summer coming up, I'm sure they could work it through. So, we've had a bit of an overview, let's look at this in a bit more depth. To give us a bit of background, I've travelled close by to see our very own North Shore correspondent, Alexia Russell. Alexia, the producer of The Detail, why am I talking to you as uh, one of our expert journos today? Um, well, I guess I've been writing stories about local bodies in Auckland since there was a Takapuna City Council, but I guess more importantly, I've done this walk hun probably hundreds of times. It's my favourite walk in Auckland, really. A great one to take visitors to, um, and also I have sort of close contacts on various places who've been able to give me a bit of an inside look into what's going on here. What would you say would be so special about this walkway? There's lots that's special about it. I mean, you often see school groups down there because it's it's a lava walk. So you're walking across a lava field. And a lot of people think that it's the lava field caused by the eruption of Rangatoto, but it's not. It's caused by the eruption at Lake Pupuki that left the lake there. And a long time ago, 100,000 100, years ago, there was a forest in between the lake and the sea. And this eruption took that forest out. And so now you can see in, in the fossils and the rocks the sh imprint of punga logs, um, a great big kauri tree where the trees were burnt out but the lava cooled before the trees finished burning. So it's an absolutely fascinating place. It's absolute waterfront the whole way of course so you, you know, the, you'll often see dolphins or orca or it's New Zealand America's Cup sailing out there. It's great whether it's sunny, whether it's stormy, you know, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's part of the National Walkway, the Te Aroa Trail. It's got um, some weird little historic foibles like a concrete swimming pool that some of the locals tried to build a long time ago, oh. a castle. It's got a giant's chair that the kids love sitting in, which if you have to take this detour, those kids won't see because it's on the bit that you have to miss out. It's got... Mansions. <laughs> it's really hard to know whether to look at the ocean or the or the inland at times, uh, and it's even got a you know a house with a cable car, which you don't really see in Auckland much. But there's this impasse. There's this real impasse at the moment between the council and one of the property owners. So, how did that come about? Okay, so a little bit of the history of this pathway. Once these homes were all batches, you know, obviously before the Harbour Bridge was built, it was a seaside resort, and. There were gentlemen's agreements for people to let, cross over to their land. Their property borders are right down to the sand. It's land that they would never have been able to build on anyway. It was, you know, it's rocks and surf pounding in there all the time. But the old Takapuna City Council, the old North Shore City Council, failed to turn these gentlemen's agreements into easements. So as time goes on, there's nothing formal about the access. And there are... 72 property holders whose land this walkway crosses who are just allowing us to do that. They don't have to do that. So it's through the largesse of these people that the walkway uh, exists. So the council kind of failed to do anything and make it formal, so that's where we're at now. Yeah, well, I, I guess you would say, why would they bother? You know, this is they don't see any future problems with it. These landowners aren't going to build over that land because they can't. Why shouldn't it continue forever sort of thing. But as time went by, most of those batches obviously got knocked down, turned into fabulous houses on the waterfront. They put their walls up. Uh, meanwhile, the numbers of walkers keeps growing and growing and growing. The last batch standing gets a Heritage A listing slapped on it. Now, the original owner, Clifton Firth, was a notable photographer from the mid-last century. I mean, notable with an asterisk, you know, he's no, you know, Anne's Westra. His son, Paul Firth, was happy living there and 
when the boardwalk uh, washed out in front of his property, which was actually still part of his property, the old boardwalk that crossed the outside of the rocks, it came out in a storm in 2011. He started letting people through his backyard, essentially. Now, this is different to the other access ways because literally you were in his garden. You know, you, you were within several metres of his house. He was a really lovely guy. He used to stay out there and meet the walkers. He'd, on the weekends, he'd put these historic pictures out so everyone could see how Takapuna and the North Shore developed. He loved meeting people. You know, he, it suited him too, you know, and everyone was very grateful for it. Everyone was very aware that they were, you know, traipsing through that backyard and, and were very considerate of it. Um, in 2012... A grand plan was drawn up, an $8.8 million plan was drawn up to turn the pathway walkway into something safer, better for old people, a little more touristy. And the locals objected quite vociferously to this because there are so many people now doing this walk and they just could see a time when it was just constant streams of people. That plan didn't fully go ahead. Some areas in Milford have been upgraded, um, but the, the important stretch that we're talking about um, never happened. Then Paul Firth died in 2021. His beneficiaries, obviously he had no children, his beneficiaries obviously want to sell the place, but there are lots of problems. The big one is this Heritage A listing. Just a note here, Auckland Council's heritage protection isn't the same as being on the New Zealand Heritage Protection Trust's list. This is crazy. It's, it's a shack. It has asbestos in the roof, it's falling down, it's damp and it's mouldy. It's pretty incomprehensible, if you've seen it, how you think this can be a historic place, but apparently it's a historic shack. Also, (laughs) Paul, in spite of being part of the Firth Concrete Clan, was not from the part with money. He was on a benefit and had one of those arrangements with the council that they would take his rates bills out of his estate. Now, that rates bill now amounts to $78,000. So the beneficiaries also, obviously, they want to do some sort of deal where they won't be lumbered with this big bill. Another complicating factor was that there was uh, Paul wanted the cottage turned into a writer's cottage, but there's no appetite for that from the council. They already have the Frank Sargeson cottage. You know, it's hard to really see why they would spend that money when, you know, potholes need to be fixed and playgrounds need to be built, why they would spend that money on a second artist's cottage. The council, and it's sort of been lost in lost in time, Tom. Nobody seems to remember or figure, have figured out how the historic listing got slapped on there. I don't think the family certainly didn't ask for it. You know, I think they're the unfortunate result of having been the last in the line to exist as a, a batch, you know. They, they're still part of history, but the beneficiaries of the estate are now sort of paying for that history. The Firth House's Category A status gives it the highest level of protection. Documents supporting that say it has, and I quote, architectural significance as a survivor of the modest houses, many batches or weekenders that used to line the beach at Thorn Bay. And it makes a notable contribution to the built environs of the Black Rock shoreline, standing in stark contrast to the larger architecturally designed homes in the vicinity. And if it looks a bit familiar to you, papers also note the house was used as a set during the filming of Under the Mountain in 2009. Another reason for the protection was the rustic simplicity of Clifton Firth Seaside Home illustrates another aspect of his life, a life associated with the North Shore's artistic community. The other thing is, it's not the council can't just promise to take that Heritage A listing off because it's not up to the council. It's some sort of mysterious process whereby the staff make recommendations and an independent group makes a decision. So the council just can't come and make a deal with the family. Is it like an independent commissioner on behalf of the council? Yes, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, and also the latest report, the latest internal report to the council was that the staff didn't see how anything had changed since the heritage listing was put on to now take it off. So there will be, I think, quite a battle to take that listing off, in spite of the fact that on the surface it doesn't really look like it's worth saving. So put that together with the Auckland Council's um, very tight monetary situation at the moment, you know, everything that's going to the dogs, they could be up for millions and millions if they start making promises. What I understand what the beneficiaries want is just for this historical listing to be taken off and they say if that's taken off 
the fence will be down that day. <laughs> yeah, well, a bit. And they could make a move to do that, but it, it's expensive. They will have to outlay a lot on lawyers' fees and getting the place assessed and trying to convince the Heritage Trust that this should be done. And then there's no guarantee that they will at the end of it because you can't leverage free access to the public against a historic place listing. That's not going to be in their calculations. So it does seem to have come to a bit of a you know rock and a hard place. So what Alexia is talking about here, how they can get rid of the heritage status, is through what's called a plan change, either at the council's cost or the owner's cost. But the owners don't want a bar of that. Alex Witten Hanna is their solicitor. To get their view, I went to his office in Takapuna. Alex, thank you for joining us on the detail today. First question, who are the owners? The owners are the beneficiaries of the estate of Paul Firth and the estate of his sister Anne Firth. So they're family members, are they? No. Okay. Um, Is there any more information you can give us as to who they are exactly? I think they'd rather remain private. So when did the fence that's there now, when was that put in place? That was put in place on the 29th of September. The council was given that date as a deadline and they had time to to deal with the issue. They didn't have to lift the heritage listing by the 29th of September. All they had to do is to say, look, we'll put the process in place, get it done. We didn't expect to be before Christmas, but sometime early in the new year, they made some kind of a commitment um, to lifting the heritage listing in a reasonable space of time by people would not have put the fence up in the first place. If they were to make that commitment now, the fence would come down the next day. But you must understand how complicated it is to stop. That's category like A, heritage listing. That's very complicated to let go. Well, look, it wasn't complicated for council to put it on. They didn't even talk to Paul Firth about it. He, they didn't get his consent. They put it on. They take it off. They know what the processes are. They take it off. Look, End of problem. Well, I don't know if it's that simple because there's a plan change process. This is what the council was saying. There's quite a complicated plan change process you have to go through to do that. Well, they can go through that process. So they can say, look, we'll go through the process. It's going to take us a few months, but we'll go through it. And at the end of the process, the heritage listing uh, will come off. Why don't your clients do a private plan change then? Why don't they go ahead with that? Because that would take the heritage listing off, wouldn't it? If they a- applied privately, they would be put through all sorts of hoops that are expensive. They, you know what it is to deal with councils, uh, planning departments. You need professional planners and also they'd, have, they'd want historians to get involved. The council would put all sorts of obstacles in the way. So... What exactly do the owners want? They obviously, as you've said very clearly, they want the heritage listing uh, taken away. Uh, what do they want to do with the property after that? Well, the chances are that they'll sell it. And? Pay off their mortgages. These are young people with mortgages. They don't have money to splash on council processes. They sell it and they can pay off their mortgages and get on with life. And the people of Auckland have been gifted the walkway. Do they want to build a, you know, a nice new, um, no. one of those beautiful modern apartments? No, yeah. they don't have the money to do that. But they might sell it to someone who would do that. Well, they might. Nobody is going to buy it with that dilapidated, run-down cottage on it with a heritage listing. Mm. Uh, but once the heritage listing is, is off, it will be in, in the same position as all the other owners along the waterfront. But wouldn't there be, uh, I mean, isn't it important to restore and keep that such a significant building? We have offered to the council, look, lift the heritage listing and if you love the cottage and it's important, you can take it away and you can put it on a nice site, do it up, and it can be a writer's residence, whatever you like. But it wouldn't, you can be, have it. it wouldn't be in the place that it's known to be at. It wouldn't have the same significance in a different place. So? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, a, it's one of the most crucial kind of sites on... You know, look, it's a universe. dilapidated old cottage. There's nothing inherently, architecturally speaking, worth preserving about it. It's a, a kind of a, a nice feeling. Perhaps as you walk past, you can see that's the old cottage where Clifton Firth, before the Second World War, the photographer, where he lived. And that's the cottage where Paul Firth used to live and talk to people. But really, it's not about architectural significance. It's a, 
It's almost a spiritual significance. Well, wasn't that somewhat important, having a spiritual significance? If the people of Auckland are not prepared to pay for it, and they're not, then it can't be sufficiently important. If it was important, the council would buy it. Well, something I noticed when I was walking along was there was that, you've probably seen it as well, there's a sign saying Paul Firth Walkway. Have you yes. seen that sign? It's got yes. the little peace sign. I mean, shouldn't we try and resolve this towards peace for the sake of Paul Firth? Absolutely. And that's why if the council says we'll put the process in place to lift the heritage listing, the fence will come down the next day, if not the same day. Well, what if this impasse lasts for, for months <laughs> or years? Well... I wouldn't be surprised if the council prevaricates like that, that in the meantime, the community will take the matter, matter into their own hands. What do you mean by that? Well, already drug users have been inside there. Um, do you have evidence of that? Yes. If you were to go inside now, you'd still see the pea packets. The police have been in there. The place likely to be destroyed, could be burnt down. People are going to get very fed up with the situation and the intransigence of Auckland Council. That's it for today. I'm Tom Kitchen. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Today's episode was engineered by Jeremy Ansell. Our producers are Alexia Russell and Bonnie Harrison. Thanks to John Watson, Alex Wittenhanna and our very own Alexia Russell. Hey, Kona. Cool